Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Nicole Broder. My pronouns are she, her, or they, them, and I'm the same coordinator at the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force. Hi, my name is Jenna Cohan, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Sexual and Domestic Violence Program Coordinator at the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And this session is a collaboration between our two organizations, uh, the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force, or SATF, and the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, or OCATSVA. Little background about SATF, I assume you know about us if you're attending this, but hey, maybe not. Um, we were founded in 2001 by then Attorney General Hardy Myers, following a summit that took place in Central Oregon in 1999, addressing sexual assault um, and systems response uh, in Oregon. And so out of that, the task force was created to help advance both prevention of and response to sexual assault across the state. Um, and we've been going strong for 20 years. We have programs in SANE, so Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner. Uh, we have a prevention program, a campus program, uh, criminal justice, and then we also have a training institute, uh, which is helping to bring this all to you today. We also have eight subcommittees um, that members sit on. We have over 100 members from across the state representing a variety of disciplines, and they help us out through those committees, which range from medical forensic work to advocacy, legislative and public policy, men's engagement, and a whole host of other ones. I won't list them all off. You can find it on our website, OregonSATF.org. And Alcatswa, or the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, was founded in 1978. And we are Oregon's coalition. Every state in the US has their own coalition. Um, some have two, some are split between domestic violence and sexual assault. Oregon is dual, so domestic violence and sexual assault advocacy agencies. And our role in the state is primarily to support our member agencies. And those are the community and tribal based advocacy agencies around the state that have applied for membership. So things that we do with them include training. Um, when not in a pandemic, we do program visits. If there's anything that you want to talk about in person or have a training about in person, we do TA, which is a fancy way of saying that we just talk to you. <laughs> you can call us, you can email us. Um, the program coordinators especially are here to support with whatever advocates need. And we also do systems advocacy. So similar to the Sexual Assault Task Force, we might sit on committees for DHS or OHA or different um, systems around the state to make sure that survivors' voices are being heard and committed to in the process of creating anything new. And we also do legislative and public policy work at the state and national level. So one of the ways that you may have seen OCADSPA and SATF collaborating over the past year and a half is in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. So whether you're a SANE or an advocate, you may have seen some of the joint guidance come out from OCADSPA and SATF. We recognize that because Oregon is filled with a variety of different communities and different circumstances, and because obviously guidance has changed significantly over the course of the pandemic and continues to do so. Um, we've tried to keep up with that guidance as much as possible and help folks who are trying to provide sexual assault response in a way that is responsible towards their patients, responsible towards their own safety and the safety of their families and those around them. So please feel free to check out our website to find that guidance and we hope that it will be of help to you. Another way in which we have collaborated for years is with our prevention programs. So SATF is a pass-through program for the Rape Prevention Education Funds, and they do a bunch of amazing work around the state with programs around prevention. Um, OCADSFA also has a Prevention Through Liberation project, which we support uh, Again, we support prevention programs around the state and our prevention teams work really closely with one another to make sure that we're supporting preventionists in the best way possible and also moving the work forward. And another way in which we collaborate is around healthcare. So um, especially around response to domestic violence, we're recognizing that there is a gap and need for more training and more support and amplification around uh, utilizing our tools, our advocacy tools in supporting folks that are accessing health care for something outside of sexual violence. So, so in our session today, we're going to be focusing on dynamics of power and hierarchy in the healthcare environment. Um, whenever a sexual assault patient presents for care, they end up 
um, engaged in those dynamics in some form or fashion. And while that is a huge topic that we could easily spend, I don't know, a whole week <laughs> talking yeah. about, we're going to try to touch on some basics about how you can thoughtfully navigate um, that environment to improve care for that sexual assault patient, whether you're on the medical side, the advocacy side, law enforcement side, whatever the case may be. Um, ways to interrupt microaggressions and also reminders about how the tenets of advocacy can help guide you in those goals. So one of the ways in which power and hierarchy really shows up in the healthcare environment is, unsurprisingly, between healthcare staff. Um, and as someone who has been a floor nurse, an emergency room nurse, a clinic nurse, and a SANE, I can say, and I'm sure that many um, other nurses who are watching this will identify with this, that the power dynamics in each of those roles was wildly different. Um, and it differs by facility as well as by role. And so while that may sound really um, obvious, I feel like it is worth calling out and just really being aware of, especially because in the same role, we tend to be more autonomous than many other nursing roles that we may inhabit. Um, we may know more about uh, current medications or CDC recommendations than many of the doctors that we're working with, which may be an opposite um, situation from some of our other roles. And yet the hierarchy in the hospital by and large and in healthcare environments in general, not just hospitals, tends to remain that physicians are at the top, other um, LIPs are uh, beneath there, so licensed independent practitioners, for those of you who aren't healthcare. Um, followed by nurses, followed by, you know, respiratory therapists, uh, social workers, and other specialists like that. And then at the bottom of that hierarchy tends to be what I kind of think of as like the hidden hospital staff, the housekeepers, the dietitians, all those folks who are working really hard and are incredibly important to keep the hospital running, and yet very rarely get this sort of, um, attention or appreciation that nurses and doctors do. Um, and I'd throw the CNAs in there too. I recognize I'm also missing like a ton of professions in the healthcare environment with that, but thinking about how these dynamics that we have learned to navigate in our different roles may impact our uh, patients that we're seeing who have been sexually assaulted is really just worth the time to think about. Um, and in particular, how to navigate those with respect to make sure that the patient gets the absolute best level of care that they can and that the trauma-informed nature of the, uh, of the whole visit is able to permeate from the entire community around them. Now, one thing that comes into play a lot in the healthcare environment is that the really stressed fast-paced uh, nature of healthcare tends to bring out some of the worst human qualities that otherwise we may be able to, um, you know, mindfully bypass. I've seen some studies about how more, how quickly our brain goes to biases, assumptions, prejudices when we're in a stressed and fast-paced environment versus when we are in a more relaxed environment. I would say that when we're in a relaxed environment, we're able to really be our best selves which are still flawed to be sure. Uh, I know I'm still, you know, I've got my biases that I'm working on every day and will continue to do for the rest of my life. But me in a relaxed environment is more likely to be able to access the things that I know up here that maybe I was cultured into something differently down here versus in that fast paced environment where you're really just trying to get a lot of times control in a situation that may feel out of control. Some of those worst instincts um, that are some of the things that we grew up with may tend to show up more. Mm -hmm. And for advocates, um, this is a very different atmosphere than a lot of the atmospheres that we're in, right? We know that working with sexual assault survivors or survivors in general, we want to go slowly, we want to go at their pace, we want to meet them where they're at. And at the hospital, that's really, really challenging. And we're going to talk about later more um, ways that advocates can utilize our own skills in that environment. But I just want folks to be thinking about how we are moving into an environment that is not ours and is not the survivors and how that can impact um, our interactions with everybody. 
This can also be especially complicated if a SANE is coming in from outside that hospital system. Um, we have a variety of different ways that SANE programs are organized across the state. Many hospitals use SANEs from their own staff, but other ones will use SANEs from agencies or outside organizations. Um, where it's a kind of a collective pool of SANEs who are all drawn from the same set of hospitals and then respond to those hospitals in turn. And that I have found being a nurse who has worked in that environment um, has a really interesting effect on power and hierarchy as well. So on the one hand, I found that coming in as an outside SANE even though you know, I feel confident in my practice, um, feel confident advocating for the patient, some of that is eroded a little bit by the fact that I may be a stranger in a new environment. And I could definitely tell as I responded to certain hospitals multiple times and then other hospitals really infrequently that my ability to speak up for myself felt for myself and my patient, I should say, felt a lot more difficult in the facilities where I was not as familiar and not as comfortable. On the other hand, that also worked in my favor in some other ways where coming in as an outside sane, I sometimes felt like I got a level of respect and trust um, that I may not have gotten if I had been a, a healthcare professional in that facility, especially from doctors. Um, SANE is the only specialty that I have been in where I've had doctors literally just tell me, tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> tell me what to order and I'll order it. I've had very respectful relationships with doctors in other specialties, but it's never been that complete handing over of trust. And I think, again, while certainly that trust can absolutely exist between um, doctors and nurses within a facility. I think sometimes the fact that I was coming in from the outside kind of gave me this, I don't know, aura <laughs> of, um, of expertise um, that enabled some of that to happen. But then on the flip side, sometimes I can't find where the hot blankets are or where the ice machine is. Um, and those are really funny ways that power and hierarchy can also show up when I have to go bug someone else in the middle of their work and I'm relying on their goodwill to show me where I can get my patient a drink of water. Another relationship where power and hierarchy can really show up is the relationship between healthcare staff and patients. One of the things that can be really hard for healthcare professionals when they're working with sexual assault patients can be losing that prescriptive attitude of we know best. And, you know, not to poo-poo that attitude entirely, like there are many areas of healthcare in which we absolutely need to bring our expertise to bear for the good of the patient. When I've had a diabetic come into the ER with a blood sugar in the 3000s, which I hadn't previously known was possible, uh, that patient needed a certain set of things. Um, and certainly there's a lot of expertise that healthcare brings to sexual assault patients as well. However, that sense of we know best really becomes a lot more nuanced and um, just doesn't quite hold as much water when it comes to sexual assault, just because there's so much involved in the context of the patient's life and everyone's so individual in what they need for emotional healing and physical healing and to regain their sense of autonomy and respect, all those different things that may come into play here um, are just much more individual than we maybe are used to seeing sometimes in the healthcare system. The other way that this can be tough is when SANEs come in, or other healthcare providers too, with their own sense of what justice entails or what healing entails. So sometimes I'll see um, healthcare professionals who have absolutely no ill intent towards the patient say things like, well, you know, don't you want to report this to police so that this can't happen to someone else? Mm -hmm. And their sense is that justice is, you know, getting this person caught. Um, protecting the community and not really recognizing that that may not be what that patient needs right then and that it's not actually that patient's responsibility to keep the assailant from uh, from assaulting someone that it's ultimately the assailant's re responsibility not to assault someone and so sometimes without that background and sexual assault dynamics um, it's really easy to fall into those patterns and sometimes unintentionally do harm with the patient but something that can make that tricky sometimes too is that I've found that healthcare professionals often underestimate um, 
I was going to say their own power, but I'm going to say our own power. Cause again, I'm culpable here too. Um, where, because we feel comfortable in the environment, because we have background knowledge, it's hard to remember that sometimes the patients that we're seeing don't have that same fami familiarity or comfort level and maybe feeling a hierarchy that we are not quite feeling. And what I try to remind myself of is that even when I am in a healthcare environment as the patient, even though I'm a nurse, even though I work in healthcare all the time, it is hard for me to speak up and say no to a healthcare provider or to speak up and, you know, hold them in the room for an extra moment because I need to ask a question if they're on their way out. Now, sitting here on the couch, you know, talking with you all, um, that seems kind of silly to me. Like, obviously, if I didn't have all my questions answered, I should just say like, hey, also, I have a question on this thing. But it's hard sometimes in those moments when you're feeling the effects of that, that power. And so what one thing that I do with my patients, and I know many other SANES do as well, is first off, we explain the options for the exam to the patient at the beginning of the visit and let them know that anytime they can absolutely ask us to stop or ask us to change the exam, change their mind on anything. And that's great. Where I think though we really need to consistently go is then following that up by proactively asking the patient every step of the way. Because saying like, oh, hey, if I'm assessing any part of your body that you're not comfortable with, just let me know, is very different than going, hey, I would like to examine you know, your left breast now. Do you feel comfortable with that? Um, and oftentimes it's a lot more comfortable for a patient to speak up and say, you know what, actually, I'm not feeling ready for that yet. Can we wait? Or actually, I don't want that done, rather than for you to start assessing their breasts and then them go, hey, actually, I'm not cool with that anymore. It just tends to be a lot harder and tends to be a barrier that we may underestimate. And uh, one thing to think about there for advocates, and we'll talk more about the advocacy piece in the latter half of this, but um, ideally, an advocate would be there during all of this, right, if the survivor wants that. So as soon as Nicole or the SANE was there, an advocate would also be there with the survivor to help the SANE mediate things or, you know, catch any microaggressions or, um, you know, violations of consent or anything that's going on. And that that's vice versa, not that advocates are always perfect. And we'll talk about that too. But um, in that hierarchy of power, we really want to make sure that we are trying to equalize things as much as possible. So we'll talk about that, but I just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, absolutely. And another area where it's really helpful um, for scenes to be aware of um, the effects of this and where advocates can also help keep an eye out too is in the language that we use. And I think, you know, we all know that medicalese is like a different language. Many of us, it was like learning a whole new language in nursing school. And even being aware of that, we often, again, underestimate how comfortable we've gotten with it um, and how much we just kind of take for granted that we understand what's being said or um, what kind of side effects may be, things like that. So making sure to use as like kind of neutral and basic language as possible without being condescending to the patient, but just in the sense of clear communication and checking in frequently to see how the patient is understanding things. Again, proactively ask for questions instead of putting that on the patient's shoulders. Part of this power and hierarchy too is also just recognizing that by dint of being in the healthcare professional position, we have access to details about the patient's life that many other people wouldn't have. They don't have the ability to look up our birth date or our mm -hmm. medical history. And that intrinsically builds in again, a sense of hierarchy and power that is good for us to just be aware of and respectful of. Now, where this can get interesting is that that can also lead to greater understanding on our part, or it can lead to a greater disconnect. On the one hand, we can glean lots of great contextual details about the patient's life that can help us tailor the visit to be really individualized and pertinent to them. On the other hand, it's really easy to see the summary of information that's collected in a medical record and 
possibly jump to some biases and assumptions. And again, not necessarily on purpose, but just because we are trying to synthesize information quickly in a fast paced environment, and it can still do some real harm to our patients. So one of the ways that that can show up is when we have patients who, for example, we see as frequent flyers, um, which is a term I know just like non-compliant is like not supposed to be used anymore. And I know it still gets used. It's a very human thing, right? To notice that you're seeing someone in again and again. And it's also human to feel frustration about that or to start jumping to conclusions. But the onus is on us to kind of catch our inclination to do that and really take a step back and still treat each visit with the same seriousness and respect that that patient deserves and not write anything off just because we happen to have seen them before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know that a lot of the folks who would often be termed frequent flyers by medical staff are the most vulnerable folks to sexual assault, right? And so um, we really need to catch that if, if medical staff, often it's not the same, right? It might be the nurse who's coming in to give STI prophylaxis. It might be, you know, the charge nurse who's, who's setting something up. It might be anybody. And if the SANE isn't catching that, um, we really want to be on our game and make sure that we are making sure that they are taken care of in the moment, that they are not relying on, for example, past drug use, if they've been in a hospital with overdoses, if they are experiencing homelessness and the ER is their primary doctor, you know, we really want to make sure that um, we are getting across to staff, not in front of the survivor, but getting across to staff that they need to be treated as if every single time they come in, they have been sexually assaulted because we know that the likelihood is, is near 100%, right? And we come in knowing that they are likely to have experienced sexual assault at a higher rate. So um, when it comes to advocates place in this, just making sure that we're catching those microaggressions, looking out for those microaggressions uh, because the survivor's catching them, whether we do or not, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I would, again, put that onus on the SANES too with other staff who are not medically forensic trained. Not that SANES are immune to this either, but I do tend to see that most with staff who don't have that background and do, again, for completely human reasons, get frustrated with accounts that maybe don't seem to match up. You know, we're trained in the healthcare environment to look out for um, symptoms and uh, histories that don't necessarily match. Um, and yet all that training can, um, like Jenna was saying, really undercut the quality of care that we're providing for some of the most vulnerable patients that we may see. One of the other ways that we can really counter some of um, the negative effects of power and hierarchy in our practice is just to be more aware also of systemic oppression and its effects and um, inherent biases. And that, again, could be a huge conversation. And I really just want to acknowledge that there is a level of complexity and nuance that we are not going to be able to do justice to today, just because we don't want you staring at a screen for that long. And also that we are not experts in everyone's experience of oppression, microaggressions, um, and all those different factors. Um, but we do just want to touch on a few different things and hopefully point you in some directions to continue to do this work if you're not already doing it on your own or in addition to any work that you might be doing on your own. First off, I want to mention how much education really comes into play here. We tend to treat education, especially healthcare education, as something that is, you know, very concrete, um, not nuanced, pretty black and white. And especially in the past year and a half, I think more resources have become easily available or known by folks um, to look at how the medical system and the healthcare system has played into systemic oppression, um, racial oppression, class oppression, I mean, keep going, right? Um, on a whole bunch of different levels. And so recognizing that that's also crept into our education. Sometimes it's in you know, who are we using as baseline for averages? How are we learning about different conditions that may affect certain racial groups differently? And are we learning about why that distinction is made? And if it's still something that's valid and the kind of context for that, rather than just saying XYZ group is more susceptible to something. 
there are a lot of myths that continue to persist, again, often implicitly, not necessarily explicitly, in healthcare professionals about the different um, kind of physical fortitude of different races, different classes, and all of that can come into play without us realizing it. And again, not to sound like a broken record, but I want to keep tying this back to the fact that this is not usually people trying to be bad towards their patients. It's usually people who are overworked in a very fast paced system, synthesizing information in a way that speeds things up for them and so feels helpful and yet can have really negative effects on the people that they're seeing. So lots of different great books um, that you can read on that, lots of great trainings. Again, I think especially the past year and a half, while none of these issues are new, I feel like I'm seeing more resources out there because of some of the social conversations that have been taking place. But then also recognizing how that's impacted everything else too, including what information is ending up in the medical record and how does that affect our perceptions of the patients and what we are prioritizing in terms of our patients identities um, versus what's not showing up or what's maybe more hidden or harder to get to or doesn't have the nuance associated with it for more on this too i would invite you to come to um, well to watch the pre-recorded session we have on unpacking oppression in our work um, or in healthcare and other environments, kind of two different names going on, um, and to attend the work session for that, where we'll really go through a resource that can help you evaluate the effects of these things in your own life so that you can just react more mindfully um, and make sure that you are living up to the ideals that you want to live up to. Yeah, and for advocates, um, this is really our bread and butter, right? Or it should be. Uh, we know that the root cause of domestic and sexual violence is oppression, and so we, we learn a lot, even if we're not from the communities that we're serving, about how disproportionately violence has affected those communities because of power and control, right, and because of oppressing one group. Um, so we really need to be going into the hospital thinking about that, and, and have our eyes open to that. So I'm thinking of um, a survivor that I responded to who was completely terrified of the medical staff, did not trust the medical staff, but was there because she knew she needed care. Um, the survivor was Native American and there was a huge distrust of the medical system one, we should know historically that that's a completely valid distrust, right? And then also, we don't know what a survivor's previous experience in that hospital with those doctors in a different hospital has been. And so they may be coming in with a whole history of medical traumas that we don't know about. And so we need to be able to sit there in that with the survivor and make sure that they're getting what, they're, what they need, even if we're not seeing what they're talking about in the moment, right? So if they're talking about microaggressions, we need to meet them there and advocate for better treatment. And we'll talk more about this in the advocacy session, um, but we also need to just keep everything aware of uh, people's histories with the medical system, like with fat phobia, with homophobia, with transphobia. These are populations that have been significantly harmed by the medical system and continue to be. And so what the survivor in front of you is experiencing, you might not be experiencing that at all. You may never have experienced that. You may have walked into a hospital and been treated well every single time your whole life. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. We want everyone to experience that, right? But again, it's part of meeting the survivor where they're at and advocating for what they're saying that they need. And it's really important for healthcare professionals to recognize that those systemic effects are going to, well, actually for SANES in particular, to recognize that those systemic um, effects are really going to change the patient population that we're seeing mm -hmm. and kind of self-select a lot of the patients that we're seeing. I can say that in the course of my SANE career, the overwhelming number of patients I have seen have been young, white, and female. Mm -hmm. Now, young, white females absolutely get sexually assaulted, not discounting anything about that at all. But I also know that there are that all genders, that all racial identities, um, that all ages are affected by sexual assault as well. And I have not seen them in the hospital. Now, that's not something where like they came in and then I saw them and I did something wrong and they left. This is, they're never getting to me in the first place because of the system that we've set up. 
And yet we are all part of that system and we can keep working on making that change, trying to make it more accessible for folks. And also just recognizing that patients may come in with baggage that has nothing to do with you. And it, it is still our responsibility as healthcare providers to give them a reason to trust us rather than putting that burden on their shoulders to find a reason to trust us. Mm -hmm. Those little incidents really can build up and create a huge positive change for folks. Some of that can be done as easily as making, you know, intake forms um, more comprehensive um, or more accessible. It could be things like watching for neutrality in your language. We have so many gendered things in the hospital mm -hmm. and some of them, sure, makes sense, but there's a lot of it that's just there because that's how it's been done. If it doesn't need to be gendered, let's de-gender it. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing I like to think about when I'm thinking about um, different gendered things such as uh, gendered aspects of the charts that we may use is, you know, what if I have a trans patient come in, but also what if I have someone who has genitalia from what we would normally consider, you know, female anatomy and genitalia from what we would normally consider as male anatomy? How uncomfortable would it be for them to fill out that form? And would it make them feel like they are not normal, not typical, or exoticized in some way? Let's try to remove that, make things more neutral so that everyone gets to show up as they are and feel comfortable in that skin. This can also come into play with how we screen folks. I've certainly been the patient before when a healthcare professional has asked me that typical screening question about whether I felt safe at home, but it was asked in the sense of, well, you feel safe at home, right? Which showed that they'd already made an assumption about me based on my chart, how I looked, I don't even know other factors that they probably weren't even aware of. They'd already decided that I did feel safe at home. If I didn't feel safe at home, which thankfully I did, but if I didn't feel safe at home, that would have been particularly uncomfortable to speak up in that moment because they had clearly already made that determination about me. And it can go the other way too. If you've already kind of made up in your mind that someone doesn't feel safe at home because of something in how they look or dress or speak or something in their chart, then they may not feel believed if they say, actually, I do feel safe at home. And either way, you're interrupting clear communication with the patient. Um, and again, that power and hierarchy there of being um, the healthcare professional who's kind of like telling them what their life situation is will break rapport and just not serve um, that patient visit in any way. The last facet that I want to touch on in terms of how power and hierarchy can interact staff when they work with patients is how discharge planning in particular, although this could show up in any way, may be affected by staff who in, with good intent are trying to focus on risk reduction and may end up stepping over the line into victim blaming instead. And again, I see this especially in terms of healthcare professionals who don't have medical forensic training, who don't have a lot of training on sexual assault dynamics or neurobiology of trauma, and so may mis misattribute um, cause and effect. But also it's something that humans, I think, in general are susceptible to, and so still a good reminder um, for saints as well. And so that can be a tricky line sometimes because a lot of it is how it's said and how much um, the patient is involved in that conversation. So in terms of risk reduction, that's absolutely something that as healthcare professionals, we should be working on with our patient, you know, checking to see are there areas that they feel unsafe and where are, um, where are steps that they could take to have that agency over their safety um, and make decisions that they, that they want to make. Where that can get really tricky though is when that comes to things like, oh, well, maybe don't go out to a bar alone or, you know, don't wear that dress. Mm -hmm. um, and while I've never heard things said quite that explicitly, it's still sometimes the message that comes through, which is going from risk reduction, like, hey, someone else chose to do this for you. And here's how, here are things that you have recognized can make yourself feel safe to here's something that someone did to you because you did X, Y, Z. And mm -hmm. so avoid X, Y, Z. It can be a subtle difference, but it's a really important one to make sure that we are in line with patient autonomy and also keeping things really survivor focused um, in terms of our care and our approach and then offender specific in terms of who we are putting the blame for the assault on. 
Yeah, I also think it can go um, in a bit of a different direction with infantilization of survivors or their patients. And so um, one thing that I have seen is uh, an ER doctor discharging a patient, a survivor of sexual assault who was not choosing to receive um, any prophylaxis and completely okay, right? We had talked about that with her. And the doctor in discharging this young patient said, well, I, you know, I really think that you should get STI prophylaxis because you know how boys are. And that the boys that he was talking about were, one of them was the person that assaulted her. And so that was an extremely triggering thing to say. And obviously um, not, it didn't land well with the survivor or with the advocate, right? And so um, that, that model of, uh, you know, discharging a survivor and saying, you know, take care of yourself, sweetie, really like, you know, go to AA or go to NA. And, uh, you know, while it's coming from a place of care, we really want to catch those moments of, you know, paternalizing or maternalizing or just in any way demeaning the survivor and their ability to keep themselves safe. Another aspect that's always important for healthcare professionals to be aware of, and especially in something like a sexual assault visit, where we're likely interacting with multidisciplinary partners that we may not interact with in other settings, is recognizing the power and hierarchy differences between healthcare and other professions who are coming into the healthcare environment. Sometimes we can get a little territorial, whether we mean to or not, with a sense that this is our realm. And so other folks who come in, you know, they do things our way. Um, and just kind of keep an eye out for if that's coming up for you. And remember that we really want to meet our partners on an equal level, um, especially with advocates. We want to recognize that they have a really important role with the patient and that while sometimes that can happen in a way that can help out our exam too, that that's not the role of the advocate to be our hands or to be our aid, that they are really there for the patient first. We know that responses look completely different across the state, right? A response in Wheeler County is going to look very different from a response right in the middle of Multnomah County in Portland, where there are a lot of hospitals. You might never interact with the same scene twice, whereas in a rural setting, you might see the same saying every single time you go to a response. And so depending on where you're at and where your agency is at, that respect and that trust may already be built. It may be like the relationship has nothing in it yet, or in not very nice circumstances, the relationship may be built in a not very great way, right? Um, so when we are uh, coming in as advocates, we need to be confident in the fact that we are the experts in our role. We are just as important as every other profession there. Um, and as Nicole was saying, our responsibility is to the survivor. It is not to the scene. It is not to law enforcement. We don't care about whether it is investigated or not unless the survivor does, right? So when we are coming in, just knowing that we are the experts and that there is a certain amount of power and privilege that comes from that, although it's going to look different than with other professions. And something that SANES can keep an eye out for is that even if we have a really good relationship with advocates, we understand what, we, what they do, it's very respectful, that not everyone in healthcare will recognize what someone like an advocate does. And that there is just a base level of power and privilege that comes from being in a profession like nursing that is automatically understood to some degree by the general population. Now, do they understand the intricacies of each specialty? No. But if you say you're a nurse, they, people know what you do just as in a general context, whereas advocates oftentimes don't have that same privilege. And that in itself just leads to some inequalities and hierarchies that can come into play. And that's something that we can help support as SANES um, by recognizing that, being aware of it, and just being respectful and attentive of it. Right, right. So um, depending on, you know, the survivor's experience, they may have no idea what an advocate is. And so us coming in and saying we're an advocate means nothing, right? Um, or they may have had experiences with advocates in the past. We really never know what we're walking into. And so if we have a saying who's holding up the importance of our job, that's great. It validates our profession. Often we're seeing some tension with law enforcement and advocates as far as like respect for your role in the process. And so that can be helpful. And then also recognizing that that does 
elevate the hierarchy with the survivor then. So what we were talking about, making sure that we are equalizing, that we are bringing ourselves down to the survivor's level while also bringing ourselves up to meet other partners where they're at and making sure that those two distinctions are kind of playing in our head. One of the approaches that I like to this that kind of balances what Jenna was talking about is the sense of using every introduction to another discipline as an opportunity for a warm handoff. I feel like that sort of confidence and trust and um, just like really clear and warm collaboration helps build up the kind of trust and respect in the patient who we're seeing while also allowing them to really interact with that other person, whether it's advocacy or law enforcement or whoever, as a person instead of just a job title. And I feel like that can kind of help hit that balance sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the areas that I hear saying sometimes feel on the other side of power and hierarchy when it comes to other disciplines is when law enforcement comes into the hospital. And some sayings absolutely still feel kind of in the more dominant position of power and hierarchy in that situation, but many others um, may feel more subservient when it comes to law enforcement. And I just want to remind you, just kind of like what Jenna was saying in regards to advocates, really own your expertise. And just like, you know, many healthcare professionals won't know about sane practice in particular, many law enforcement officers who you meet won't necessarily have a lot of experience with sexual assault victims in particular. Mm -hmm. And so may not always be aware of some of the laws and rights that come along with being a patient who has experienced a sexual assault. So absolutely feel free if you are seeing a gap in knowledge, and we kind of talk about this a little bit more in the SANE Certification Commission presentation as well. But if you're seeing a gap in knowledge, the officer doesn't realize perhaps that an anonymous kit is something that the patient is entitled to, absolutely feel free to speak up for that. Um, really try to treat it as a collaborative opportunity to reinforce education and just build closer ties between um, the, the different disciplines. Now, one other area that we may not um, really see as directly, but which is helpful to just kind of keep in mind, is that many disciplines who we work with in regards to um, sexual assault response may be trying to get information from hospitals or interface with hospitals, and that oftentimes getting that communication clearly can be tough for folks. And I will admit that even as a nurse, I often struggle with how exactly communication works in the hospital environment. Maybe some of you feel a lot more comfortable with that, but I would be willing to bet that there are many <laughs> of you who feel in the exact same situation. And again, that's, you know, I'm, I'm part of healthcare. I've been a part of healthcare for a decade. Um, and there's still sometimes that sense of uncertainty. And so for partners outside of the healthcare system who are trying to communicate with the healthcare system, that that can often feel like an area um, where they feel like they are lacking power. Now we're going to talk about uh, power differences between other disciplines and patients or survivors. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about advocates and how we can sort of, as I've been saying, equalize um, that power dynamic. So one piece that might be coming up is maybe you have a prior relationship with that person that's in the hospital. So perhaps in rural areas, it's pretty common for if there's only one um, agency, that survivor may already be working with an advocate or they may know each other in another context, right? And often we might only have one advocate that can respond to the hospital. So so this can present itself in a whole myriad of ways. If we show up to the hospital and we know that person from our personal life, um, regardless, we're always going to go in, we're going to introduce ourselves, we're going to let them know that we can stay or we can leave. Um, we also could give the SANE our name and have them let the survivor know and have the survivor choose whether they want us to come in or not. Um, there are a couple of different ways that that can go, or if we're already working with that survivor, that might be helpful for us to be in the room because we have prior context. The survivor may already have some trust built with us. Um, I have definitely been on responses where uh, the patient, the survivor was somebody that I had already worked with. And so I already had knowledge on recognizing when this person was dissociating, um, knowing what this person liked to call different parts of their body, what their preferred vocabulary was. And so that ended up being really, really helpful um, and sort of neutralized that power. 
but it might not be like that. You may have had a previous interaction with that survivor that was not beneficial. There are just so many different ways that that can present and in urban areas as well. Um, not as likely, but it definitely is a possibility to have had a prior relationship. And so I really encourage programs to have those conversations in your sexual violence teams or with your sexual violence advocates to talk about that. If that is at all a possibility, you know, what are the policies around that? Well, how can you best support the survivor's autonomy and ability to decide their comfort level while also respecting the fact that they have the right to an advocate? So that's one piece that can present itself. We always um, need to keep in mind that although one of the core pieces of our job is to walk alongside the survivor, we do not, you know, lead them, we do not, uh, you know, in any way influence their decision making, we still have the ability, the capacity by being in that situation and by being a professional to influence decision making, right? So even though we might think of ourselves as, you know, just another person off the street, we're there to support them, we're there to, you know, go in whatever direction they want to go as long as we've given them informed decision making abilities. Um, they might not see us that way. It's very often that they won't see us that way. And so if we are making comments about, you know, well, if I was in this situation or, um, you know, I've, I've worked with this police department and they really, you know, care about their job or, um, you know, you can do an anonymous kit. Maybe that's something you want to do instead of just letting the evidence go to waste. I'm fairly certain none of you would say anything like that anyway, but I just want to mention those things that we really need to be careful about our vocabulary because it can have a real impact, especially right after an assault. Um, if that if this happened very recently, a survivor is not going to have as much access to the logical center of their brain. We know that. And so we don't want to be saying anything that's going to influence either reporting or not reporting. Um, we might feel a certain way about a police department or about police in general. And we really want to keep that out of the interaction unless the survivor mentions things that are congruent with our feelings. And I think it can be tough, especially um, when you have a sur survivor or a patient who is feeling adrift and wants to know your opinion because they want that to guide them. I know I've been asked as a saying multiple times, like, well, what would you do in this case? Would you report to police or not? And back when I was an advocate, I got the same question. I'm just going to assume Jenna, oh, yeah. that you have gotten oh, that yeah. question as well. And that I have found to be an especially tricky place to navigate. And my go-to has always been to let the patient know that I don't know what I would do in that situation because I'm not in their shoes right then. And so I try to use that as an opportunity to come back to what are their needs, what are their concerns, what are their wants, and just help talk them through figuring that out for themselves rather than falling into that trap of giving them a hypothetical of what I would do um, just to give them an easy out, which may not actually be what they want truly. I also want to mention that just as Jenna was saying that, um, you know, having a previous relationship with a survivor or background knowledge on the survivor um, can help make that interaction flow more easily. I also want to mention that that can even happen from the advocate arriving before the same. And one particular example that I'm thinking of is when I responded to a patient, I was giving her the usual list of options, introducing myself the usual way, um, talking through the steps of the exam, um, and felt like I was doing my due diligence in terms of, um, you know, going for an informed consent. And something that I really appreciated is that the advocate who had met that patient about half an hour prior to my arrival and had gotten permission from the patient to share this, let me know that the patient actually had a slight de developmental disability, which wasn't apparent enough for me to pick up on it, but which the advocate had learned about from the extra time that she had spent with that patient. And so the advocate prompted me like, hey, you may want to explain these in a little bit more depth. Um, hey, could you go a little bit more into, you know, what exactly this entails? And because it would have taken me longer to pick up on that myself, it wasn't something that was in the patient's chart, that really helped me meet the patient at that level. And you know, keep from exerting power um, just from my understanding of the situation, 
um, that I didn't mean to because she wasn't necessarily tracking with everything that I was saying. So having those kind of collaborative relationships, again, with the patient's consent in there for anything that's shared can really help make sure that communication is on level and that the patient is getting to speak up about their needs um, and not feeling like someone else ends up making the decisions for them. Mm, yeah. Um, another couple areas in which power can show up with advocacy and other disciplines is with confidentiality and privilege, right? So we have gotten to the hospital, we have talked with the survivor about their rights, um, hopefully alone, right? We've been able to meet with them alone and talk to them about their rights and, um, the, the process that they could go through if they wanted to, or the parts of the process. And we've explained to them our confidentiality and privilege abilities. So this um, can forge a bond with a survivor or, or not, you know, it depends, it depends on the situation. However, what we also can see is that it can be seen by other disciplines as holding something over them. We have power and control because we have confidentiality and privilege. And so I'm betting that a fair amount of you have had uncomfortable conversations with um, other community partners who are wanting information from us and feel like we're just being snooty or we're, you know, holding out on them because we cannot share the survivor's information. And so that might feel like a power dynamic to outside agencies, whereas for us, it's just a part of our job. It is not, it is not anything that we feel like we have power, right? It's a protection for the survivor, but it may feel like that to other agencies. Um, another piece that I wanted to share is conversations in front of the survivor versus outside of the survivor's um, view. And so some of these uh, disagreements might come up where, like Nicole was saying, this was a conversation that the survivor had wanted to have away from her, right? She wanted the, the advocate and the same to talk separately. So sometimes um, the survivor might prefer to be the one asking the questions. That should always be our default, right? We should always be asking uh, if the survivor would like to ask questions or share things before we would ever share things on their behalf. Sometimes if they prefer for us to share things, the default is to share them in the room with everybody, right? So that there's full transparency. But if the survivor prefers for us to have conversations outside of that door and they tell us exactly what we, they want us to share, that's great, that can happen. And we need to make sure that we're adhering only to what they are wanting us to share and not letting that conversation continue past that. The other way that that can go is if there are disagreements um, between professionals, those should never happen in front of the survivor. So our job, is to make sure that the survivor's needs are being met. And of course, we're going to advocate, advocate for that in the moment. We're going to interrupt microaggressions, which we'll talk about. Um, but if it is solely a professional disagreement, that should never be happening in the room with the survivor. And that probably shouldn't be happening during the response at all, right? So just keeping in mind um, that the survivor always, always, always drives how we are talking to people and what we are talking about. Um, and just keeping in mind where people might be feeling power when we might not feel it ourselves. Okay, so now that we've talked a lot about the medical system and power and hierarchy within the different players in that system, and as it relates to the folks that were there to take care of, I'm now going to switch gears into advocacy and our role, or rather your role, I'm not doing advocacy anymore, um, in respecting our core tenets of advocacy and how that can play out specifically with sexual assault hospital response. So um, when I talk about the core tenets of advocacy, this is not something that is like written in stone, the same words every time. Um, I'm sure people have seen like different but very similar ways to explain like our core of what we do. Um, and I owe pretty much all of this work to my coworkers at El Cadspa, so specifically Megan Shore, Renee Kim and Hillary Levine. They've done a lot of work on presentations around this and I just pulled from that and I'm putting a little of my own spin on it. So um, the first tenet that I wanna talk about is survivor-centered. So that's, as we all know, that's what we do. That's the, that's the whole basis for everything. I talk a lot with my hands, so this is gonna be happening. Um, and so in a hospital response, um, when we are being survivor-centered, we are, 
like we already talked about, we're letting them drive the entire process, but we are giving them all of the information first. We're not asking them to make decisions without full, complete information, right? So we're, we're showing up, we're talking to them, we're explaining who we are. Um, one piece of being survivor-centered might be that the survivor says, I don't want you here. And being truly survivor-centered, okay, yeah, they get to decide. That's completely in their wheelhouse. If they know what we do and they are informed, they completely get to decide whether we're in the room or not. So that may end up being the best way to be survivor-centered in a given response. Um, in a response where the survivor would like us to stay, that means maybe asking a lot of questions while we're alone to gauge what helps them feel uh, respected and comfortable. We know that uh, another piece of survivor-centered is believing, right? We believe what survivors tell us about their experience and we enforce that with other people. So if we're hitting resistance from, you know, an ED doctor or law enforcement or a SANE perhaps, um, we really want to be able to reinforce, reframe that we believe what they are saying we're going to proceed because this is what happened, right? Um, another piece of survivor-centered is empowerment. And we already talked about that a little bit with uh, making sure that they are the ones making the decisions. Um, part of this is with anonymous kits, reporting, um, full kits, you know, like Nicole was talking about, making sure that they are guiding every step of the process. And hopefully you will have a SANE that is checking in a lot about whether they want to continue. And if that's not happening, um, we want to empower the survivor to be able to advocate for themselves and let, let the SANE know if they would like to stop um, or if they would like to cut out any part of the exam. So uh, another piece is choice. Um, I feel like we've already talked about most of these, but uh, the choice piece could be regarding whether to proceed with the exam, or it could be maybe about uh, something like HIV prophylaxis. Perhaps the, the scene says, you know what, I would really recommend taking HIV prophylaxis because, you know, there were multiple assailants or, you know, what have you, uh, and the survivor doesn't want to. And medically, the SANE might feel like, you know, this is really a good idea, and they, and they might say that. Um, and our job is to make sure that if the survivor is saying they don't want to do something, even if we personally feel like that would be a good idea, right, um, that we support their choice in whatever realm that looks like. So uh, another piece is trauma-informed. I'm talking about stuff that you already know, but I'm just going to give some examples of how that could look. So trauma-informed... Um, means that we are well-trained in what trauma can look like, how it can present, and that everything that we do is with that basis. So um, we show up at the hospital and uh, the nurse that's been attending to the survivor, there's no saying yet, says, you know, I think she's inebriated or she's on something. Um, and we go in and we recognize pretty quickly that they're just in a trauma response, in a full-on trauma response. Um, we're, we're talking to them. They're not really able to talk back, uh, but there's no, there's no indication that it is anything other than a trauma response, and it wouldn't matter if it was, right? Um, so we come in with that knowledge of knowing really, really deeply how trauma can affect people and how that can show up and that it might mimic other things that people might jump to first, right? And so that might be a situation where we are just giving a lot of time. We might be sitting in that hospital room for three hours, four hours until they're ready to have a conversation. We might be asking them, um, you know, if they need anything, we might be turning on music, we might be giving them a warm blanket, um, really just coming from that place of knowing that trauma affects everybody differently. Other ways that I've, uh, that I've seen and that I know other people have seen that I've heard people talk about is laughing. Um, during an exam or when they're telling about their experience. And so it can be helpful as advocates to have that knowledge if someone else in the room, like a detective or maybe their caseworker, is, you know, kind of taken aback by that or, or pushing back on them about, you know, maybe this didn't actually happen because, you know, otherwise they would be acting a different way. Um, we can really be the holders of that, of that knowledge and help to support the survivor's trustworthiness um, regardless of what their affect is. And sometimes it's helpful to even normalize that for the survivors themselves. Mm -hmm. I've had patients before crack a joke and then sort of be horrified at themselves because they recognize that they were in 
you know, a really hard spot and didn't understand why humor might be their go-to. Um, and honestly, some of those situations have been pretty funny, the jokes that they crack. And so I try to meet them where they are. And then also if they do sort of express some sort of horror or amazement, like what's going on with me, just normalizing for them that that's a perfectly normal trauma response. And that it doesn't mean that I don't think that something happened, that that's sometimes just how we try to connect as humans after we've had something difficult happen. So normalizing it for them, as well as for other people in the room can be really helpful. Absolutely. Yes. And I agree. I have heard some really funny jokes come out of people at the hospital. And, <laughs> and it's just a reminder that we're dealing with full humans, right? Like they may have just experienced something horrific. Um, and they are a full human. They have all sorts of stuff going on. They are not what happened to them, right? That might be the first thing that they're, that we're talking about in the moment, but they might have a great sense of humor and we need to be able to be where they're at and, and keep our poker face, right? Um, I've definitely heard language used that I might not use in, in my life and that we just need to meet them, right? Um, so that's, that's where that can take place. And then also safety. Obviously, we're going to be safety planning with people. That's going to look completely different depending on the person. One thing that I've encountered a lot and I would guess that most of you have encountered is uh, medical staff asking what the safety plan is when we are leaving or when the survivor is leaving. And um, of course, without the survivor's consent, we wouldn't be sharing anything about the safety plan that the survivor has made with us. And so uh, one, one way to continue to build partnership without, um, like I was saying before, that partner feeling like we're holding information over them is to say, we've made a safety plan, right? That's, yep, we've talked to them. And you can mark down if you need to, you know, if you need to check a box that says that a safety plan was made, your, your job is done. You called an advocate and they met with the survivor and that's what I can tell you. Um, and so that's a way of not doing the, we can neither confirm nor deny, which sometimes, you know, is not the time or place to say that, uh, while also saying like, yeah, dude, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the safety plan. Right. Um, Another core tenet or something that we like to keep in the back of our minds is collaboration and transparency. So this goes along with everything that we've been talking about before with power and hierarchy is we are collaborating with the survivor, right? We're making, we're making those plans together. Um, we are supporting what they need and we're really on par with where they are. We are constantly checking ourselves to make sure that we are not um, in any way utilizing our power and if we have any in that situation right uh the other half of the piece that we're talking about right now is transparency and so we know as advocates um that sometimes we have not fun information to give survivors or um, information that is upsetting to them or makes them angry and we still our job is to is to be as transparent as we possibly can um, we don't ever want to hide information from a survivor as that will erode that trust. And our whole job is to be trying to build a partnership and collaborate with them to enact whatever they need to happen, whatever they need for their healing or their safety in the moment. And so um, one way that I can think of that this comes up at the hospital is say we have um, a 16 year old who is at the hospital, we're meeting them um, and they have told, they have already told medical staff about their assault, right? Um, and medical staff, I'm assuming at this point, has talked to them about being a mandatory reporter. And so they, they know that an, a report is being made. They know that law enforcement is on their way. Um, our job is to make sure that they know their rights in that situation, but also not try to sugarcoat things, right? Law enforcement are coming. They're going to come. And, uh, and that's just the way that it is, right? So we can talk about the fact that what that's gonna look like, which is completely dependent on your area, who might be responding, maybe in your area, DHS responds, um, but we can talk about what we know that looks like in our area. And then we can also talk about their rights and responsibilities. So they have the right to not answer questions. They have the right to just take a card and sit there. They have the right to tell them anything that they want to tell them. Um, but we are not going to try and make things more comfortable for the survivor in the moment in a way that's going to backfire later and make us less trustworthy, right? 
And that's something that's really important for saints to keep in mind as well. I've certainly had lots of uncomfortable conversations with patients, um, particularly those who fall under an age-related mandatory report about my need to make a mandatory report. And that can be a really uncomfortable reminder about the power that I do hold in that situation and definitely a chance to erode the rapport that I've built up with the patient. And everything that Jenna just mentioned is exactly what should be guiding healthcare professionals as well just to be really open and upfront so that the patient doesn't feel like they're tricked into anything. Mm -hmm. And then making sure that anything that they choose to do or not do is supported by us and that we um, don't pressure them uh, one way or another. I've had situations before where, you know, there was someone who didn't want to report to police and I let them know that I did have to make that report. Um, but let them know, just like Jenna said, that that didn't mean that they had to cooperate, that that was totally up to them and that I was going to respect whatever their choice was. I also made sure to let them know that because police could get a court order for my paperwork, that they you know, could choose to accept or decline any parts of the exam and that anything that they did with me would you know, likely be seen by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And that patient, you know, most of the patients I had that conversation with chose to go through that exam with me anyway, even knowing that law enforcement was going to see it, even though that wasn't their original choice. Now, if I hadn't told them that and then they'd gone through the exam and then found out afterwards that law enforcement could now access all this information, that would obviously be a completely different situation. But owning up to the power I had in that situation and then also acknowledging where they retained agency was super important for making sure that that was truly trauma-informed care for them. Yeah, and jumping off of that, uh, what Nicole just shared, that might be a great time for an advocate to ask for a couple minutes alone with the survivor. Um, from the SANE. And of course, you know, depending on your relationship with the SANE, some SANEs are going to be more amenable to that than others, or some hospital staff, perhaps, you know, the SANE, the SANE hasn't done any swabs yet, and so they could leave the room, and they've left the room, and they're not there right then. Um, but that's a great time to ask for a break, because as we know, um, survivors and just humans, us and in general, we are likely to uh, we're more likely to do something if we feel like an authority is asking us to do it, right? Actually, I'm talking to advocates. I <laughs> Not everybody, but we know, we know that that happens. So, um, so that might be a good time to just check in with them and say, hey, you know, I just want to make sure everything that you just told the same, like, is that, are we on board? Is there anything that you have questions about? Is there anything that you want me to ask the same? Um, just to make sure that they are consenting with true consent and not feeling coerced, even if that's not what the same is meaning to do. And, uh, another piece where we might be feeling tension in our own role is between trauma-informed and transparency, right? And so sometimes it's hard for us to remember that it is trauma-informed to be clear. Um, so we might want to help that survivor be comfortable in the moment. That's, that's a really normal thing for an advocate to be feeling is I don't want to do anything to upset the survivor. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to feel cared for, or at the very least, I don't want them to be re-traumatized by this experience. And um, so that's, that's when what I said before of really weighing that in the moment, it might be something that upsets the survivor that is more trauma-informed in the long run. And so really weighing those in our head and always, always going with the piece that is going to be most supportive of the survivor's choices in the long run, um, even if that means that you're losing some trust right now. Um, and then the last piece is intersections and complexity. So we talked about this with power a little bit and with historical experiences with the medical field or the medical system. Um, our job as advocates is to come in with a lot of knowledge around how people's identities intersect and how they intersect with trauma in different parts of their lives, right? So um, it's not necessarily on medical staff or other fields to understand those complexities. And as Nicole was saying at the beginning, we're not going to fully understand anyone else's experience, right? So me as a white person, I'm not going to understand a Latina woman coming in their experience with racism in the medical system. I'm not, I don't have the same experience, but what I can have is knowledge and the ability to fully listen to the person in front of me, as well as uh, belief 
right? So that's another area where we are, we are believing the survivor's experience, even if our own experience conflicts. So we're coming in with knowledge that all of these intersections are in play, with knowledge that the medical system, like every system, including our own, the nonprofit system, and even the SDV field, has a history of transphobia, homophobia, racism, sexism, you know, all of that. Um, and that the survivor in front of us might be contending with quite a few of those from medical staff or, or just medical staff in the past. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if it's right now or in the past, right? Um, and so our job is to make sure that at every point we are thinking, like, am I thinking through this the way it would affect me? Or am I thinking through this in the way that it is affecting this person given their life experiences and given what they just experienced? And also coming back to that um, whole person mentality that we are working with people because of the violence that they've experienced, but they're a whole person. And so their identities and the trauma that they've experienced are going to interact with their life in multiple different ways, you know, mentally, physically, in the community, with their family. And so we, our job is really to kind of keep those intersections in mind all the time. And I know that sounds exhausting, but I think, I think innately we are trained to do that. So this next piece is about interrupting microaggressions, but I also want to say that it's, it could be microaggressions all the way up until just aggressions, right? Some of these are definitely not going to feel like microaggressions, um, but we're just using that term uh, for, for the presentation. Again, like Nicole was talking about earlier, and like we've mentioned a couple of times, this one topic uh, could be and has been days long uh, training, right? So talking about it for a few minutes is totally an overview. We acknowledge that this is barely scratching the surface, but wanted to check in about it a little bit. So when we're talking about microaggressions specifically in hospital response, when we're planning for hospital response, I'm thinking especially about folks that have not been in the hospital yet, newer advocates that are just being trained and or um, advocates that have not been able to be in the hospital setting for the last year and a half. So uh, there are some of our advocates who have been able to get back into the hospital sooner, but some of, some of you haven't even as of now. So we just wanna talk about planning. Um, when we're thinking about microaggressions, depending on what they are, we can plan for some of those upfront, whether it's within our agencies doing some uh, anti-bias training or really working on our own staff and our own stuff, um, whether it is planning amongst the advocate team, you know, what does that look like in the healthcare environment, depending on whether it's a doctor saying that, a nurse, even a SANE, um, and some of it's going to be on the ground planning with the survivor if we have the chance to do that. So that might be talking with them um, in our, you know, five minute conversation that we have with them when we're introducing ourselves. Um, is there anything about you or about your experience that you think is important for me to know? You know, how would you like me to respond if someone says something that is disrespectful or not congruent with your experience? Um, some survivors might want you to respond in the moment. For some, that might be really uncomfortable and they would not like you to. So we never want to assume that someone wants us to just jump in and be, you know, a warrior. Um, so a couple of examples that we wanted to go through. One is misgendering. Um, this is, we are aware that, um, you know, like I was talking about before, all systems, but especially when we're talking about the medical system, transphobia, um, and just misunderstanding of gender identity uh, has, has existed for a long time, right? So we might notice misgendering um, coming up, perhaps a survivor's name in their chart is different than their name that they are using, their current name, um, and perhaps the provider is assuming pronouns, perhaps their pronouns have changed and uh, the survivor has you know, not had the opportunity to update their medical chart. Uh, perhaps they don't have a medical chart and people are just making assumptions and that's what happens, right? Um, so in those cases, if someone is being misgendered in the moment, if that is the first time that's happened, we might want to defer to the survivor's reaction. Um, and maybe the next time that we talk about the survivor, we might say, well, she said 
instead of, you know, maybe the, the medical provider used he, him pronouns. Um, that's definitely something that if we have the chance to talk to the survivor beforehand, we can introduce ourselves. We can say, hi, I'm Jenna. I use she, her pronouns. What's your name? Um, and if they share their pronouns, we can ask them like, Hey, if you, if anything comes up around that, if someone uses different pronouns, how would you like me to respond to that? Um, and then we might know if we don't know, uh, you can read the room and, and do what you do in the moment. And if it happens multiple times, that might be a situation where we should say, Hey, um, they told you they use she, her pronouns. And so, you know, that's what we need to do moving forward. Um, but again, you're going to know that survivor in that moment and every single person feels differently. So that's one area where microaggressions could come up. Um, another is with language, language barriers. So a lot of us um, may have responded to hospital responses where we don't speak the language that the survivor speaks or medical staff doesn't speak the language that the survivor speaks. And so best case scenario, um, medical staff is offering a medical interpreter. And in situations where that doesn't happen, uh, we have likely been, or, or some of our programs have likely been in situations in which the advocate has been asked to interpret. And I just wanted to make sure that we talk about that since that is um, not necessarily a microaggression, but something identity-based that is giving that survivor uh, a lower quality of care than a survivor who might speak the language that the provider speaks. And so we, we know as advocates that we cannot interpret um, during the medical exam, during the law enforcement exam, we cannot be the interpreter because then we cannot be the advocate. And we also, if we are part of a criminal case as the interpreter, um, we could be called to testify, right? And we are not in our, we're not in our role as an advocate. We don't have advocate privilege. It, to it completely changes our role and also for those of you that speak multiple languages, you know that it takes a lot of mental capacity to be interpreting in real time. And we need to have our wits about us to provide good advocacy, right? So there's all sorts of reasons why we wouldn't be interpreting. Um, and that's one area where we would maybe be making a stronger stance in front of providers and really advocating for why the survivor needs an interpreter and, and has the right to an interpreter. And I would really remind healthcare professionals about that as well. Um, you know, I've had cases where uh, my patient spoke Spanish. I used to conversationally speak Spanish back in the day. It's been a while. Um, and it took me long enough to learn English medicalese. <laughs> and I definitely don't know Spanish medicalese. And a lot of native English speakers don't speak again, medically, it's like we were talking about, it's, kind of, it's like an entirely different thing sometimes. And so to make sure that we are communicating clearly with our patient, we need to make sure it's someone who not only speaks um, their primary language, but can speak the medical side of their primary language, which is an even harder thing to find. And just another good reason why we want to use a trained interpreter. That said, as a saying, I've also um, used you know, like language lines on cell phones, which tend to run out in the course of an exam. And in those cases, I've certainly, when, when I'm able, for example, like with my Spanish speaking patient, um, I've used my little bit of Spanish just to let them know like what I was doing, keep them in the loop, like communication is always a good thing. But any of the bulk of the exam, the content definitely needed to be left to someone who was trained in that specifically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Another piece that, uh, that all of these are coming from experiences that Nicole and I have had. None of these are um, just random out of the box experiences. These are things that are, you know, have really happened um, and probably a lot of you will identify with. So um, one, one piece that is always horrific is when someone notes their disbelief in the survivor's experience in front of them. Uh, so I, I had an experience in which I was responding to um, a sexual assault response with a person who was experiencing severe and persistent mental illness and was well known um, in our rural community. And so the um, law enforcement officer noted in the interview with the survivor that, you know, she does this all the time. I'm just going to take the report and leave in front of the survivor. 
So that's, that's an example of, we would never just be quiet and let that go. We don't need to know how the survivor feels about that necessarily. That is a clear, clear breach of roles and all of the core tenets of advocacy. So that would be a situation in which we would speak up and we would say, you know, hey, I believe this person, we need to proceed with this report the same way as we would with any other report. There's no reason not to. And I would like you to, you know, rephrase that. And then of course, going back to what we were talking about before, not getting into a, you know, fighting match in front of the survivor, but just very clearly um, advocating that they be treated like any other survivor that presents to the hospital um, and not any differently because of their identity, regardless of, you know, how many sexual assault reports this person has taken, right? And hopefully that reminder should be enough to make that person jump back into their professional role. If you are getting pushback, then that would be a good time to pull them aside and have the rest of the conversation in a more private environment. And that way you've spoken up for the um, for their disrespect right there in front of the patient, but then the more in-depth stuff you can, you can do on your own. Mm -hmm. And remember, you know, it is always the survivor's choice to take a break, um, or to stop a part of an interview or an exam. And so as advocates, we can always be checking in, you know, after something like that happens, do you want to take a break? Do you want to take a five minute break and regroup? Um, and they can say yes or no, right? But that is that is always their right. And that sometimes is what people need to have the ability to say, you know, I don't, I don't want to continue with this. Um, or it just lowers the temperature a little bit. And Jenna mentioned, you know, saying this in front of the, the patient. I also feel like this is a good chance to remind folks, you know, either reminding yourself or you may have to remind colleagues and partners that, uh, Healthcare facilities are never as soundproof as we think they are. <laughs> and I've run into so many healthcare professionals in my same role and otherwise who will speak out in the halls about something that they would never say in front of the patient, but really underestimate how much the patient can often hear from inside their room. And when I've spoken up to folks about it, a lot of times the excuse I'm given is like, oh, no, they couldn't hear that. Like no one ever has mentioned that they could hear it. And again, I would just remind folks about that power differential and how uncomfortable it would be to come out of your room and go, hey, I heard you saying this thing about me. Um, and just reminding folks that uh, people hear a lot of things that we don't think they do. And even if they don't, err on the side of caution. And also try to be respectful to the patient in private, just like in public because that helps foster a community of respect in general but that may be something that you need to remind folks of yeah yeah absolutely um another another piece that can come up depending on the community um is uh genders other than cis female that are coming in for an exam and um really really checking our own biases um, noting if we're, if we're seeing other professionals react in a way that um, indicates unease or discomfort or they're verbalizing discomfort. Um, I, have, I have heard of situations in which someone has said, oh, I, you know, I've never done this before um, to a male survivor. And that would feel incredibly devaluing. And also, um, you know, survivors often struggle with the fact that to them, it feels like they might be the only person experiencing that. That professional has just validated that, right? Um, and made it sound like they, re they really don't belong here. Um, and so as the advocate, that can be a really tricky one in that situation. Uh, we might want to, we might want to just pull out our, you know, normalizing information, you know, well, actually, this is a really common experience for a lot of males and, you know, it might just not have come up for you yet. Um, or, you know, supplant with whatever you feel is more appropriate. But that's another situation in which um, normalizing for the survivor would be really, really important. And if we're still in a room with a professional, we could do that in a way that uh, is still respectful to the professional, but bringing in our expertise in order to support the survivor. Some uh, agencies, depending on how large you are or how many advocates you have or who's in your area, uh, may work with survivors who are incarcerated 
And uh, that may be a specialized advocate that's working with that person that has a lot of experience with that population, or it might be whoever's on the crisis line is responding and someone from the local jail or the local prison is coming to the hospital for a safe kid or for any type of an exam. Um, that is a very different type of response and varies completely depending on what type of facility is in your area. And we know that uh, this is a population that faces a lot of discrimination, right, um, and a lot of assumptions. And so if, if we as an advocate are going in feeling unsafe solely because that person is coming from a facility, that's going to, we're going to telegraph that, right, that, that survivor is going to feel that immediately. Um, and also, if that survivor is being talked about solely based on the fact that they were incarcerated and not as a survivor, not as a full human, talking about as an inmate, you know, those are things that we can try to counteract with our own language and how we speak to them, um, speaking to them the way that we would speak to anybody else that is at the hospital, right? Regardless of whether a guard has to be in the room, um, regardless of the fact that they might be, you know, in handcuffs when they're brought in, they should never be in handcuffs during an exam, <laughs> right? Um, so that's, that's a situation in which we would really want to prepare for that as a staff if PREA advocates are not necessarily the ones responding to those. And sometimes with some creativity, you can find ways to meet whatever requirements there are, for example, having a correctional um, officer there with maximizing the patient's privacy. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some occasions, for example, where I was able to do the hist to take the history with the patient with the glass door closed, but the inside curtain open so that the officer couldn't hear what was being said, but was still able to fulfill his duty of having eyes on, um, making sure I was safe, all of that stuff. And then for the physical exam, we did the reverse where we had the, um, the curtain closed, uh, but the glass door open so that the officer could maintain audio contact and again, fulfill his responsibility. And I just talked about that with the patient, made sure that they were comfortable with that. Um, we made sure that anything that they didn't want the officer to hear, that we really made sure to do all of that when the door was closed. And then we were like pretty quiet for the physical part of the procedure so that I didn't end up um, unintentionally violating that patient's privacy. So a lot of times there are little workarounds that you can do and it just takes a little bit of creativity. The other thing I've run into sometimes with patients from correctional institutions is that I find a lot of disbelief um, from other professionals in that in particular, whether it's law enforcement or um, other healthcare staff. Um, I've heard a lot of times with this patient population more than any other, oh, they're just faking it to like, get out of XYZ. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we know that, that, um, that inmates are a particularly vulnerable population, that there are oftentimes a lot of power and hierarchy things going on there that can leave people very vulnerable. Um, and so again, never wanting to dismiss someone based on their circumstances, but making sure that we give the same level of care regardless, because we are unbiased healthcare professionals, and that should be true for any of the patients that we see. Yeah. Um, the creative ideas that Nicole was just talking about is a great reason why when we're thinking about, you know, how to go back into hospitals after the last year and a half, if we haven't been in there, how to rebuild relationships with hospitals or clinics or wherever we're seeing those exams being done. That's where it could be really great to have a tour if you don't know the layout of your hospital, if you don't know where those exams are generally going to be taking place, you might not think of those things in the moment, right? I mean, it's our job or your job, I keep saying our job, as advocates to be creative. And it just helps if we know the layout, if we know what it's going to look like, if we know, you know, if someone is brought in, they go into this room, unless it's in this case in which they go into this room, and just kind of thinking through the geography of the safety plan and what that could look like. Um, can be really, really helpful. Another piece that we've talked about a lot, but is, you know, all of us are going to see it probably multiple times throughout our, our careers is victim blaming. Um, and we talked about that a little bit with, you know, oh, sweetie, maybe you shouldn't drink anymore, or maybe you shouldn't go out to that place. Um, so we have covered that a little bit. I just wanted to bring that back up and note that as something that 
would be really, really appropriate to interrupt in the moment. Um, because of course, as an advocate, our job is to normalize and bring correct factual information and be the experts in the field of sexual assault, right? And so um, if someone, maybe it could be a family member, we haven't talked much about that, but it could be a support person that's in the room with them that is saying problematic things. Um, and so it might be their parent that's saying, you know, I told you, I told you this wasn't like a safe person to hang out with. And as the advocate, we could bring information about how the majority of sexual assaults are somebody that someone knows, right? And, um, and that that is not uncommon and it's not the survivor's responsibility to avoid those tracks. It is only the responsibility of the person that committed that act to choose to not sexually harm other people, right? And so that would be a situation that in most cases, it would be really important to say that in front of the survivor. And again, in a way that is, you know, respectful of their support person, because we're assuming that that support person is in there because the survivor wants them. Um, and also, of course, always, always, always coming back to that support of the survivor. And what can be tricky too is when the victim blaming is coming from the survivor themselves, mm -hmm. which is one of the most common places that I see. And I find that um, it's just a, a little bit of a balancing act to interrupt the victim blaming while also validating the survivor's feelings um, and really hearing them and not making them feel cut off. And so what I tend to go to as a saying is expressing like understanding that that is the direction that they go um, and that that's something that's really common and then reinforcing that it's not actually on them, that it is, as Jenna mentioned, on someone who sexually assaults to not sexually harm other people, but letting them know that I hear them first and that, you know, that their reaction is understandable, even if it's just because of you know, the social messages that we get. And then that kind of gentle reminder um, seems to have worked the best for me so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, if, you know, it might look different if it's a one-time comment versus a repeat comment. Um, of course, if it's the survivor making those comments, we would react the same, to, the same way every time. And if it's a support person or another professional making those comments, that might, again, be a good place to ask if they want to break and ask if they want to speak privately. Um, and then have a discussion with the survivor about, you know, do you want me to, do you want me to interrupt that? How does it feel for you? Does it feel more comfortable or more uncomfortable if I, you know, respond to your parent? Um, and, and again, always reinforcing like what we know is, mm -hmm. um, and giving them correct information about sexual assault. One other area where I've, um, seen things come up is that sometimes providers will, uh, try to talk a patient out of a certain line of therapy, oftentimes HIV prophylaxis is where I found this, because they make assumptions about the patient's ability to continue with that course of medication. Um, in particular, where I find this most often is that I have at times run into resistance from providers um, from prescribing HIV prophylaxis to patients experiencing houselessness. Um, the assumption being like, oh, there's mental illness involved with a lot of um, houseless people. Uh, oh, they can't follow up on things because they don't have a steady place to live. Um, just a whole host of assumptions really come into play when I've run into this issue. And so something that I always try to do is just, again, gently remind the provider that it's not our job as healthcare professionals to be a barrier to anyone accessing the medical care that they want to access. And then I understand that they're concerned about possible side effects if the patient does not follow up as agreed, but that our responsibility is to inform the patient about risks and benefits and then support the patient's decision. And that as long as they have done that, have that conversation, know that the patient understands those risks and benefits, and absolutely they can document that to, to make sure that they're covering their bases, that at that point, it's our job to help the patient meet those goals that they have for themselves. So um, like we talked about before, those are only a few examples. I'm sure everyone watching this has their own examples that they've experienced or they've heard from other coworkers or, or from clients, survivors um, of other experiences of racism, homophobia, transphobia, 
all of that that they've experienced. So we just wanted to give a little overview and just encourage folks to have these conversations in your own agencies. Make sure that you're starting with yourself first, um, because of course we are well trained in oppression. And also, as Nicole was talking about before, you know, we grow up in the culture we grow up in, and so we have been steeped in um, in if you are in dominant American culture, in a culture of racism and homophobia and misogyny and all of that. So we really wanna start within our agencies to figure out where our own biases are and how we can unpack that. And then make sure that we are planning for that when we're responding, regardless of where it is, but right now we're talking about at the hospital. And I also wanna note that um, it might be the advocate that's, that's doing this, right? Advocates are not perfect. Um, we all come in with our own stuff. We might be well-trained in this field. And also we might say something that the same notices and is like, whoa, that was not okay, you know, or I really need to reframe that. And so I do want to encourage, because we're talking about collaborating and building these relationships and rebuilding in some cases, um, that the same, if they are noticing something, also has the right to say that and validate the survivor and support them um, in a gentle way, like we were talking about before. Is there anything you want to add to that? No? Okay. <laughs> um, and then always at the, uh, at the end of this, just to bring it back at the end of this section, uh, because we're talking about power and hierarchy, just thinking through in those situations who has the power in that room in any given situation. And so, you know, maybe there's a situation in which um, someone responds, an advocate responds, and the survivor does not want to work with, say, a male advocate. Survivor doesn't want to work with a male advocate. Um, and the power in that place lies with the advocate, right? They are the people coming in um, as a professional. And so, our job as advocates, obviously, is to re-equalize that, that power imbalance. And so recognizing that in this situation, the advocate has the power, they need to make sure that they're meeting the survivor where they're at, and hopefully trying to come up with a different solution or being transparent if that is the only advocate available, right? Um, however, say there's a situation where um, an advocate doesn't want to work with a person that speaks Spanish, right? So an advocate only English speaking doesn't want to work with a person that speaks Spanish. So in that situation, um, noting the power, again, that's an even greater power imbalance. So we have a survivor who is non-English speaking. We have an advocate who is only English speaking um, coming in, knowing that there's a situation in which they need an interpreter, knowing that they need to be culturally respectful and they're not in a place to be able to do that, right? So that that is not a situation that needs to be respected, that advocate, if they know that they can't work with that person in a respectful way, needs to come up with a plan to support that survivor in their full dignity as a human being. And those things should be talked about beforehand. But if it's going to affect the survivor, if, if the survivor is uncomfortable, if the SANE is noticing something that is coming from the advocate, that's a situation in which, yes, Theoretically, we should be providing equitable services, and if it's detrimental to the survivor and someone in the room is noticing that, that's a place to interrupt. The final note I want to mention, um, kind of in regards to that as well, is tying this back to some of what we discussed earlier. Um, for healthcare professionals, in particular SANES who are watching this, it can be helpful to remember the kind of the power and privilege that we may have compared to advocates or survivors in this environment um, and that we should absolutely you know elevate their voices and we should also be prepared for the fact that there may be personalities that we're working with who will hear things better from us than they will from an advocate or a patient and so we don't want to speak over anyone or assume that their voices won't be heard but because we may have some more privilege in that situation by being a healthcare professional, it's good for us to just keep an eye out for if there's anything that we can do to help elevate those voices or make sure that the message is being heard. Our last section that we wanted to talk about because of the last year and a half, but also in general, it's such a huge and important topic in both of our fields is sustainability. And we've talked a lot about it in different little blurbs throughout the training, um, but we wanted to do just a little bit more to wrap it up at the end. So when we're talking about sustainability, we're really thinking about it in terms of at the beginning of relationships, 
what we can do right now, and then sustainability for the future, both in terms of us professionally, individually, and as agencies collaborating together. So when we're thinking about um, sustainability of relationships with the hospital or with the clinics or with the scenes, uh, we've talked a little bit about those early planning stages. And so this looks completely different across the state. Um, some counties or programs have really, really close relationships with their SANES or with their hospitals. Um, some agencies might not even know which SANES service their hospital because they haven't had a sexual assault response in a couple of months or, or in a year, right? Um, so this is going to look completely different depending on where folks are at, but we really encourage people to start with uh, those building blocks of relationships. So if you don't know who your SANES are, find out. If you are not a part of your SART, maybe reach out to the person that's in charge of that. Um, if you don't know who in the hospital is in charge of the ER, find that out. Just start making those connections and building those relationships. Um, and that will really help because we know that uh, those are the things that we can fall back on when we have professional disagreements is we can fall back on those building blocks of relationships when things go awry as they do. There's a lot of individual work that we can do as well to both um, interrupt a lot of these power and hierarchical dynamics that we've discussed, as well as improve our own sustainability. So things like monitoring our own bias or even just being more aware of the space that we inhabit in the world, even if we aren't necessarily changing the power and privilege that our role brings with us, having more awareness around that can help us navigate both those relationships um, and our relationship with our profession with more ease and more sustainability long term. Yeah. And as everyone knows, and I'm sure everyone is really sick of hearing about it at this point, this has been a really stressful time. The really? Last couple, yeah, a really stressful many years, and especially last few years. So um, when we're talking about sustainability, a lot of us are in, including Nicole and myself, are in a place of constant stress and uh, constant activation and also uh, extra sensitivity to perhaps um, what we're perceiving from other people, whether that's professionally, personally, however. So right now, where we're at in the present, when we're talking about sustainability, I think about things like, are there areas in your life where you are feeling that rub between uh, power that you hold and power that others hold, or things that are in your control and things that are out of your control? And really doing your best to figure out what is in your control to shift those power imbalances and letting go of things that are out of your control that you know you don't have the ability to change those power dynamics and so doing a little bit of self-work to recognize that locus of control um, when it is related to power and hierarchy can be really really helpful and that will help us in relationship building something else to keep in mind is that we tend to be our best selves when we have time and space and capacity, and that's been in very short supply for most folks, um, again, past year and a half, but also it can be tough just in these professions in general. And so making sure to give ourselves grace and other people grace as well, while still holding ourselves and other people accountable to the, you know, to the best response possible for survivors and patients is a balance that we just really want to approach thoughtfully. Um, small steps, keep making them, uh, keep encouraging other people to make them, and do what you can to really keep yourself going because it will help not only yourself, but your patients and also the people you're collaborating with. Um, in reading about burnout, I hear so often about how it can almost be contagious in a way. That's not the term that gets used, but that one person's burnout can bleed over into another person's um, and we want to try to stop that process and not be the person passing that on. So if that's maybe taking a break, if you're finding that you don't have um, a kind of threshold anymore and you don't have the time and capacity to kind of re-engage that, um, do what you need to do to take care of yourself in order to make sure that you are also taking care of your partners and your patients. That may also involve things like hiding a stuffed blobfish <laughs> in your training. You know, do what you need to do. Um, the world's too short. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and really specifically to talk about, you know, what everyone is experiencing in the present during the pandemic, this has been a time when everyone's boundaries have been tested, right? And so boundaries around what is your work-life balance, boundaries around how you keep yourself safe and healthy, um, physical boundaries in terms of where you can work and where you can't work. So um, when we're talking about right now, I really, really encourage people, and I know this is way easier said than done, but I really encourage people and agents to have those respectful boundaries in place with your advocates and with yourself. Like if people are not feeling comfortable going back into the hospital, that might be really hard when the hospital is really putting pressure on you to be back in the hospital, right? Because they know that advocates are a benefit to survivors and that's great. Um, and it might feel like in order to keep up that relationship and in order to best serve survivors, we need to get into the hospital as soon as we can. Um, and we're really encouraging agencies and advocates to think of themselves and their own safety first. So if your advocates don't feel safe, they're not going to provide good advocacy, and that's going to affect future relationships with the hospital. So um, we really encourage prioritizing advocates' safety first and their own, their own needs around their health and their boundaries, um, even if those are, you know, mental health boundaries, especially like Nicole was talking about taking a break. We really encourage agencies to think through those and make those plans right now because the pandemic is not over and things are going to shift when it is. Many of you, whether you're new advocates or um, new to the medical field, or you've been in the medical field or advocacy for a long time, I feel like lots of us have gotten a lot of training on being trauma-informed and on uh, self-care and vicarious resilience, right? And so this is not anything new. We're not sharing anything new with you. We're just really encouraging you, um, even especially in this relationship building process, to keep coming back to what you need, what your advocates need, what you need individually. Those boundaries are super important. And in building the future relationships, we're really encouraging folks to uh, let people know what you need, whether that's you know an advocate letting their supervisor know what they need, a SANE needing to take time off because they're super burned out, whatever that looks like. Holding those boundaries in the present is going to make future sustainability much better. So when we're building those relationships, just knowing that a no right now might be the better option than a yes that we can't we can't complete, we can't hold to. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, there are a few other sessions that you might be interested in checking out that follow up more on some of the things that we just touched on. Um, that includes how to talk about sex with survivors, um, medical advocacy, same considerations for transgender sexual assault survivors and unpacking oppression in our work. We'll also include links to both of our agencies' websites in the description so that you can follow those for more resources. And you are completely welcome to reach out to me. My email is in my bio or any of the other staff at OCADSPA, including Megan, Renee, and Hillary, who I mentioned um, were the other program coordinators. So we hope that you have something squishy to hold on to today, whether it's a blobby <laughs> or a or... karma. <laughs> and thank you for bearing with us during this webinar. <laughs>